We're looking at these parables, and um, the parable I'm going to look at today on prayer is one that we have heard before and one that I think we've already had a preconceived notion as to what Jesus means by it, and I hope to surprise you a little bit today. And so Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1, hear the word of the Lord. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, and this is Jesus giving a condensed version of the Lord's prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. Good New Yorker right here. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, Yet because of your shameless audacity, say that with me, shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. I want you to just pause for a moment. Everyone, everyone who asks, receives. Not somebody, everyone, okay? Hold on to that. Everyone who asks, Receives The one who seeks finds, the one who knocks, the door will be open. Now, some of you are saying, I've been knocking, I've been seeking, I've been asking, and it hasn't been opened. What's up, Jesus? I want to show you something. Which of you fathers, he continues, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil... Thank you, Lord. Uh, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, now breathe on us, Lord, as we look to your word. May the Holy Spirit come at this moment and open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts. We offer this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want to begin with this uh, statement that one of the greatest indications of our spiritual vitality is our relationship to God through prayer. One of our greatest indications, so the greatest indications of our spiritual vitality is our relationship to God through prayer. It was uh, Tim Keller, I came across this this past week, a great quote that the infallible test of spiritual integrity, Jesus says, is your private prayer life. That the the, the test of your spiritual integrity is your private prayer life. The Christian life is impossible to live without a consistent and deep commitment to prayer. And yet, sadly, for many, maybe most Christians, we live with what Parker Palmer, the Quaker theologian, called a functional atheism. A functional atheism. That is... That although we believe in God, that is, although we go to church, that is, although we do Christian things, we functionally live as if God doesn't exist. And when we refuse to pray and commune with God, it is our way of expressing, giving expression to the reality that we're not much different than atheists. We live a functional atheism. And yet there is a better way forward. One of the central themes of the Gospel of Luke is prayer. And in this parable that we just read, uh, this parable is to center us, to ground us, to energize us, to be people who connect to God in prayer. And when you look at this, the 13 verses I read, there are three different movements in it. And I want to describe those three different movements in three different questions. And this is how I'm going to go about my message today. Jesus essentially talks about what are we to pray? He talks about why we are to pray and what God does for us when we pray. That's what I'm going to unpack today. What are we to pray? Why are we to pray? 
and what God does for us when we pray. Now, obviously, this is not all there is to prayer, but this gives us a strong foundation. And when we think about our personal lives, our marriages, our relationships, the state of our country, racism, powers and principalities, nuclear war, all the stuff that's taking place here, this passage is to ground us in a profound reality. Now, the chapter begins with the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. The disciples made a connection in their mind. They, they looked at Jesus and they saw a man with great power. They saw a man with great love, great forgiveness, great compassion. He had a courage about him. He had an ability to speak truth to those who were in power. And they saw his life and they made one conclusion. The reason why he has that kind of power, the reason why he has that kind of love, the reason why he has that kind of truth is because he's a man of prayer. And so the only request that the disciples ask of Jesus in this way of teaching is to pray. They never say, Lord, teach us to preach. They never say, Lord, teach us to share our faith. But they do say, Lord, can you teach us how to pray? There's something about you, Jesus, that we know is connected to your life with God in prayer. And so Jesus goes on to say what they are to pray. He gives them the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is to be seen in two ways. It is a framework to describe the different realities of the spiritual life. And it's also a, a prayer so that we can pray literally word by word. And it's important to see it in both ways. It's a framework and it's, it's a prayer for us to pray word by word. Not absent-minded, but in a deep reflective, contemplative, open kind of way. And so Jesus says, you want to know what to pray? Here it is. He makes it simple for them. And then he goes into why we are to pray. And I'm going to spend the most of my time looking at this parable. Jesus says, this is what you're to pray. And now he says, let me show you why you're going to pray. And to talk about why they should pray, he tells a parable to make his point crystal Clear. He says, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight because you need some bread. The bread is not for you. The bread is for a friend of yours or a stranger uh, who is on a journey and needs a place to stay. Now, stop right here. Most of us, if not all of us, already cannot identify with the story. Because imagine you're in bed. Imagine you're sleeping. It's midnight and someone rings your bell. As good New York City people, first of all, you're thinking, who in the world is ringing my bell at midnight? Or you're thinking, I'm not answering it. Or you're thinking, uh, uh, you're going to be very cautious before you answer because there's always a killer across, you know, there must be a killer uh, on the outside ringing my bell at this time. So you're, you're through the peephole or you're looking through the screen. Who, who is that? I mean, we're very skeptical of people. We're very suspicious of people. And we got 911 ready to go. And so that's how we are. But in the parable, the man comes on the long journey and the man opens his home to him. Now, in addition to that, the, the, the host recognizes that he does not have enough bread, enough food for this person who's on a journey. And so the host walks over to his neighbor, knocks on the door, asking for some bread. And again, we see this is a hard story for us to understand because it is so foreign to our culture and so foreign to our experience. We live in a culture where we often don't know the names and the stories of our neighbors. When's the last time you knocked on someone's door asking them for some milk? Or you ran out of bread and you said, ah, CVS or ah, uh, uh, let me knock on. We don't knock on our neighbor's doors. Why? Because we're incredibly disconnected or we don't want to make it seem like we don't have our act together. Like, why are you out of milk? What you been doing? How's your finances? You can't buy any milk? What's your problem? And so, and so we don't want to give the impression that we don't have our act together. But in Jesus' day, there was a strong culture of hospitality. Hospitality was deeply ingrained into the culture. And in the village, it was not just an individual requirement. It was a community requirement. And so if a guest was village, visiting a village... 
the whole community uh, was responsible. Not just one person. Everyone was taking part in hosting this person. And so it was the duty of the sleeping man, no matter how tired, no matter how inconvenient, to stand up. And if he had bread, to give the man some bread. That's what the people who are listening to Jesus are anticipating. They're anticipating uh, this guy's going to get up, of course, and he's going to give them some bread. But Jesus flips the script on them. He surprises them. So much so, you could imagine as they're listening, they're going, oh, how, how could that person do that? Jesus says in the parable, instead of the man getting up, the man says, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now, parenthetically, what's funny about the story is that in the towns where Jesus was from, uh, they had small homes and everyone had to sleep in the same room, the same bed there. And so the man is shouting, my children are sleeping. Well, you didn't woke the children up. Uh, you might as well just get them the bread now. <laughs> but the man refuses to get up. Then Jesus says, I tell you, though, even though he will not give up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, here's the thing. The, the man outside knocks and asks for some bread in the dead of the night, in the most inconvenient time of the night. And when most of us hear the parable, especially what Jesus says after about ask and seeking and knocking, we have interpreted it in a particular way. The traditional interpretation of the passage is that this passage has to do with persistence and perseverance. That our job in prayer is to be persistent and our job in prayer is to persevere. And this interpretation has led people to see God in a particular way and see prayer in a particular way as well. And it almost comes across that our job is to annoy God until God answers our prayer. It reminds me of a clip from the TV show Family Guy. Now, I never watched the full episode of this TV show, so don't see this as an endorsement, and please don't send me any emails. Um, uh, but I saw a, a famous Family Guy clip where the son, Stewie, is trying to get his mother's attention. And Stewie's a one-year-old prodigy who has a very sophisticated psyche, and he's able to speak fluently with this upper-class English accent. And he also sounds like a grown man. Uh, check out this clip. That is not what it means to pray. That's not <laughs> what it means to pray. Prayer is not the act of annoying God until you get God's attention. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about perseverance. The Bible has a lot to say about persistence. We are to persevere because God says we are to persevere in other passages. It's the mystery of faith that we don't understand why, but God tells us to keep calling on him, keep calling on him. And we don't know. Sometimes he answers the prayer. Sometimes he doesn't answer the prayer. It's the mystery of faith. We are to persevere because of the mystery of faith. We also are to persevere because often as we are praying and as we are persistent and persevering, our hearts begin to change. Our, our motives begin to change. And all of a sudden we're not praying for our selfish desires anymore we're praying more in line with the will of God and aren't you glad God doesn't answer all your prayers can I get a witness here aren't you glad that God doesn't answer all your prayers and the reality is you should thank God that your prayer changed over the course of time. Some of, well, at one time you were saying, Lord, please send them my way. Or Lord, please send her back. Please send her back. And now you're saying, Lord, keep them away. <laughs> send her back, Lord. Why? Because our hearts change over time. And so we have to be mindful when we talk about persevering in prayer. Because often what happens is we persevere and then it doesn't happen what we want and we often blame ourselves and live with a kind of shame. But Jesus is not talking about perseverance and persistence in this passage. He's not talking about that at all. He's talking about something different. And it's a surprise for the people who heard. Jesus is, he gives a word that describes what a citizen of the kingdom of God looks like. And the word is shameless. 
shameless audacity. The Greek word there is of shameless is offensively bold behavior, assurance accompanied by, with a disregard of the presence or opinions of others. And so instead of seeing the neighbor as someone who is persistent, we need to see the neighbor as someone who's willing to risk his reputation by shamelessly confessing what he doesn't have. The man knows he has nothing to give. And he could care less about confessing this problem. And so why do we pray? Prayer, to connect what I said last week, prayer is a way of confessing our deadness. If I could say it this way, prayer isn't about getting God to do what we want, but a means of relating to God as we truly are. Poor, needy, lost, dead. Prayer is not a way of getting God to do what we want. Prayer is a means of relating to God as we are, poor, needy, lost, dead. And here's the paradox. It is by coming to God in our poverty. It is by coming to God in our neediness. It is by coming to God in our lostness. It is by coming to God in our deadness that we find paradoxically that we are truly rich and full and found and alive. And so we often refuse to confess our deadness. And prayer is a way to confess our deadness. Now, over the past uh, 12 hours or so, 18 hours, there's been a, a little hashtag on social media related to what happened in Charlottesville. And uh, the hashtag on social media is called, This Is Not Us, specifically speaking about our country saying, this isn't our country. This is not who we are. And I understand the sentiment. I understand what they're trying to say. But you know what? The reality is that sentiment is, in essence, a refusal to be dead. Because the reality is that is who this country is. That is what we have been over the years in one form or another. And until we say, Lord, this is who we are, it is only when we say, Lord, we are poor, needy, lost, dead. It is only then that the demon of racism can be properly exercised from our midst. And so this is us. We're poor, brothers and sisters. Needy, lost, dead. And until people begin to say, no, this is our reality, God is not going to breathe new life into us. And so the neighbor recognizes, I'm poor, I'm needy, I'm lost, I'm dead, I have nothing to give, so I'm going to go to my neighbor shamelessly and say, I need some help. And so prayer is God's way of living into the kingdom of God, forming us into the new people of God. And the way we pray is to shape the way we live. And so in this parable, the man knocks on the door, and the knocking is the way of life. The man lives without shame. The bread he needs is the life of God. And by coming at midnight... At an inconvenient hour, he's confessing something about himself. He shamelessly confesses, I have nothing. Shamelessly confesses, I'm poor. Shamelessly confesses, I'm lost. Shamelessly confesses, I'm dead. Shamelessly confesses, I'm needy. And so life in the kingdom of God is one uh, of, of deep dependence upon God, which expresses itself through healthy dependence on others as well. And this is why Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Unless you recognize your poverty, how can you be full with his riches? And so the question for us individually in this room is, where do you feel dead? Where do you feel poor? Where do you feel needy? Where do you feel lost? Where in your life are situations beyond your control? Where in your life are there situations beyond your power? Where in your life are there situations beyond your intellect? Where are there situations in your life that are beyond your money? Where are there situations in your life that are beyond your network? Where are you poor? Where are you needy? Where are you lost? Where are you dead? 
The reality is all of us at one point or another are poor, needy, lost, dead. Some of you came in today, your marriage is poor, needy, lost, dead. And until we begin to say this is the reality of our marriage and not live in denial, this is where we're at. We keep doing the same thing over and over again. We're not getting, making any difference. We're poor, we're needy, we're lost, we're dead. We need help. Until we confess that, we ain't going nowhere. Until we confess about our addictions, I'm poor, I'm needy, I'm lost, I'm dead. I have no power in my own strength to overcome this addiction. Until we start there, we are, we are dead. But when we begin like that friend at midnight, shamelessly confessing weakness, shamelessly confessing poverty, shamelessly confessing neediness, shamelessly confessing lostness, shamelessly confessing deadness, it is only then where we can experience the life of God. And so the man confesses his deadness. Prayer is not about getting God to do what you want. Prayer is about relating to God as we truly are. Now, the reality is we often have a hard time confessing our deadness, our weakness, because we have a reputation to protect. We have an image to uphold. We, it's called the false self that we create a, a self that, that we want to project out into the world, a, a self of strength, that I got my act together, I know what I'm doing. God forbid anyone sees that that's not the case. And so what happens is because we don't live poor, because we don't live needy, because we don't live lost, because we don't live dead, we carry these heavy burdens that end up crushing our souls. It is why... Uh, one of my favorite hymns, and, and what a friend we have in Jesus, offer these words. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I wonder how much of the burdens you're facing today, the weight that's coming your way, is there because you've never confessed to God or to others that you are poor, needy. Lost, dead. And so it's almost as if Jesus is saying in this parable, bring me your shameless acceptance of your lostness, deadness, poverty, needing. Give it to me. Bring to me your shameless acceptance of your powerlessness and I'll show you how I do business. And so Jesus says, what are we to pray? Here are words to pray. Why are we to pray? Because fundamentally we are all dead. And then Jesus goes in to talk about what God does for us when we pray. Read on with me. It says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given. You seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if, he, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds to him who knocks, it will be open. Now, when we hear those words, we often see it as this is the strategy to get God to give me what I want. And that's not how we're supposed to read this passage. If we see this passage as a command to constantly bring our deadness to God, bring our deadness to his death and resurrection, now... We're getting closer to what Jesus is talking about. Now, what's interesting in the passage, here's how I know that. It's interesting. In verse 13, Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, all that. And then Jesus says, I'm not going to give you what you want. He tells us what he's going to give us. He tells, ask, seek, knock, and then he says, ask whatever you want, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to give you. Every time, I'm going to tell you. He says, the Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Now, if I can confess, when I first used to read that passage, I would get disappointed. Because I wanted something specific. And I, and I ask it, and I go, oh, what is he going to give? And I will give you the Holy Spirit. Ah, okay. 
And I say, but Lord, what I really want is this. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, but what I really want, I know it's the life of God. I, what I, really, I know it's the third member of the Trinity, but what I really want is this. And what Jesus is saying is, no, what you really need is this. He's saying, when you give me your deadness, I will give you the, the very life of God. And even though your circumstances might not change, you will begin to change. Although the stuff you pray for not, might, might not be answered in the way that you want it to answer, you will still have life and vitality. Although circumstances might still keep going, you will have joy and peace and love. Ask, seek, knock, and I will give you the Holy Spirit. What do we really need? We need the Holy Spirit. We need the life of God in our lives and in our midst. And so God, listen, if there's anyone who knows how to deal with death, it is God. God is in the resurrection business. And if there's one prayer that God loves to answer, it's a prayer that begins with our deadness. Why? Because as I said last week, Christianity is not about God making bad people good or good people better. Christianity is about God making dead people come alive. That's what Christianity is. Not bad people good and good people better. Christianity fundamentally is about God making dead people come alive. And so he says, give me your deadness and I'll give you my life. And what I love about the story is that the man comes at midnight. Oh, I love that. And let me close with this. I love that the man came at midnight. Because it doesn't matter what time you confess your deadness. God will respond. I love that Jesus says it came. He says it's almost as, as if Jesus is saying, no matter when you call, no matter when you knock, no matter when you seek, no matter when you pray, I'm always awake. I'm always alive. I'm always at the door. And so if you knock and if you seek and if you ask, I'll open the door right for you. It doesn't matter what time we come. He's a God who never slumbers or sleeps. And so give me your deadness. The shameless acceptance that you are powerless. And I will give you my life. And so brothers and sisters, don't be ashamed of your weaknesses. Don't be ashamed of your inadequacies. Don't be ashamed that you're not the perfect mom. Don't be ashamed that you're not the perfect father. Don't be ashamed that you have hangups and weaknesses and addictions. Bring your deadness to God and God will give you life because when we are weak, then we are strong. Can you say amen? amen. And amen. Let's pray together. I invite you to close your eyes. The Holy Spirit is here in our midst to take our deadness and breathe life into us. And I want to give you a moment to just close your eyes and, and think for a moment. Where are you powerless today? Where are you weak? Where are you dead? Where are you lost? Where are you poor? Where are you needy? For many of us in this room, you've been carrying heavy burdens for way too long. As a result, you've been sick in your body. As a result, you've been filled with anxiety. As a result, you've been trying to protect a particular reputation of strength. But we're all broken, all weak, all needy, all poor all lost, all dead, unless Jesus breathes into us. Our country is needy, poor, lost, and dead, unless Jesus breathes life into us. Where are you feeling overpowered today? Some of you, you've been trying to resist it, struggling in isolation, suffering in silence. And the invitation today is to live with a kind of 
humility, beyond humility, a shameless audacity that freely accepts your limitations. Not as a way of excusing, but as a way of preparing for God's life. And so can you name that area? Is it in your home, your marriage, your finances, a particular addiction, a sense of hopelessness, a relationship that has yet to be restored? Where are you dead? And poor, and lonely, and lost, and needy. Maybe just speak that to God. Lord, this is, this is where I'm at right now. May this be a start of sharing our burdens with God and with others. about 30 seconds or so of silence and we'll, we'll close singing about the resurrection but let's offer our deadness to the living God right now Lord Jesus, Lord, we confess in this room that unless you breathe into us, we're dead, lost, needy, and poor. And yet, Lord, we confess that we have often refused to be dead. And as a result, we have forfeited the life that you so want to give us. And so, Lord, lead us by your Spirit. Lord, we long for the life of the Holy Spirit to flow in us and through us, to flow in our families, in our workplaces, in our country, in our world. And Lord, it begins by us clearly recognizing who we are and who you are. And so, Lord, may we shamelessly, like this friend at midnight, shamelessly accept our deep poverty and neediness and lostness and deadness. And Lord, we celebrate that as we do that, you release the heavens. You open up the heavens to fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we confess our deadness to you, would you surprise us with joy? Lord, would you surprise us with hope? Lord, would you surprise us with peace? Lord, would you surprise us with grace and strength? And so come Holy Spirit. Lord, we sing to you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, let's all stand, let's sing together. Amen. Amen. As we close, I want to invite our prayer team to come to my right. Invite those who are going to be offering the bread and the cup to come uh, to my left, come to my right. And the cross. symbol of our salvation and it's the pattern for our lives. It's the symbol of our salvation, the pattern for our lives. If you want to capture Christianity in a couple words, it's newness of life comes out of death. That when you entrust your death to God, your deadness, who you are, your, your, your poverty, your neediness, that he offers newness of life. That's Christianity. And we have a cross to remind us of that. That it was Jesus who did not have to die, but did anyway. And resurrects in power shows us um, the pattern for our lives. And so today, I imagine some of you in this room, you're feeling dead, poor, needy, weak. And um, this is why we pray. Because we believe in the supernatural power of God. We don't pray just to uh, have a good time. with. We pray because we need the life of God flowing in and through us. 
That's why we pray. Not to get stuff from God. I mean, and God is gracious enough that he gives us stuff from time to time too. But he says, what more can I, I give you? I give you my life. What more do you want? I give you the, my very life. And so for some of you in this room, uh, the reality is you are dead. You're spiritually dead. Why? Because you've never said yes to Jesus. And it makes sense why you would be dead. Poor, needy, lost. Because only in Jesus can we find life. And so if you've never said yes to Christ, if you've never said, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Flood my life. I want to follow you. If we've never have made that decision uh, to do so, the reality is you're dead. But the good news is you can be alive. Yeah, that's good. And so our prayer team is here. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, maybe you've been coming to church, but you've never said, you know what, today's the day I'm saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And not just forgive me, I want to follow you as well. I want to follow in your way. I want to worship. I want to follow who you are. Our prayer team would love to pray for you and walk out here receiving the very life of God, the Holy Spirit. And so we have, or for whatever prayer request you have, maybe life has been very difficult and you just need someone to pray for you and pray with you. Our prayer team would be here. And to my right, we have one of our elders, Andy, who's here, who's going to be offering the bread and the cup. And we come to a table. It's... It's a place where we are reminded that newness of life comes out of death. Why? Because we take his broken body and he's poured out blood in the bread and in the cup. And we say, Lord, I want to I wanna become who you are in your death and resurrection. So I want to, you are what you eat. I, I want to take this in. And that's why we come to the table. And so whether it's to come to the table or whether it's to receive prayer, uh, please come forward after I pray for us. And I'll be down in the... Uh, in the yellow room. And so for those of you I've never met, stop, stop in. For those of you I haven't seen in a while, stop in. Like I said, there's some hugs and some cookies waiting for you. And if you don't want the, co- don't want the hugs, take the cookies, all right? And so uh, I, I ain't mad at you, as Tupac once said. So anyway, uh, open your hands and pray. Let me pray for you. Let's, let's end on that note there. Andy, I don't know if that was the right way to end the thing on Tupac, but uh, <laughs> open your hands to receive some <laughs> Let me bless you in the name of Jesus, all right? Brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, confessing your deadness. And may God meet you with newness of life. May God surprise you with joy this week, surprise you with peace, surprise you with strength, surprise you with grace. And may you offer that grace and that peace and that joy and that love to those you encounter this week. I bless you all in the strong and the beautiful, in the resurrected name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Amen.